So good night, we can start. Okay. Well, uh, I want to welcome everyone to the, uh, our next morning session, The Revolution at War. Uh, I am your host for the next hour and a half or so. I'm uh, Dr. Frederick Schneid. I'm a Herman and Louise Smith Professor of History at High Point University and Chair of the Department of History. Uh, it's my pleasure to, uh, to navigate everyone through this next session. Uh, I do want it on the record last night, Jeremy Black chided me for my declining standard of dress uh, during the pandemic. So I want it noted officially that I am wearing a nice shirt and tie uh, as a result. You know, you don't want to uh, uh, upset uh, uh, emin eminent historians. Uh, a nice sweater and shirt was clearly not enough. Anyway, uh, so uh, the way we're going to run the session uh, is that I will introduce each speaker before their paper. Uh, I, I, I prefer it that way, so, uh, uh, so people who sign in late will know who everyone is. Uh, each paper will be, uh, should be 20 minutes. Um, if it runs over too much, my children taught me how to use video filter on Zoom, and so I will be applying funny mustaches and hats uh, if it gets a little too uh, long. So uh, I think that's even better than just raising the hand. Uh, so uh, public humiliation. Um, those of you who have <clears throat> questions, uh, please be sure to send me in the chat your questions and we'll ask it at the end of all three papers at the end uh, of the session. Uh, the order we're going to do is exactly in the program. We will do Dr. Benora, then Dr. Hayworth and Mr. Streidelmeyer. Uh, and uh, uh, I think that's, that's pretty much how we're going to uh, run the operation. Uh, so uh, without further ado, uh, let me introduce our first speaker, uh, a graduate of West Point in 1997. Uh, Dr. Michael Bonora served in the United States Army in Germany and Korea before being accepted into the graduate program at Florida State University. Um, studying first under Dr. Donald D. Horward, who's up there, I see him. Uh, in the screen. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Fritz Davis, uh, he earned his PhD in 2008 with a dissertation that investigated French influence on American warfare. Uh, Dr. Benora joined the faculty of the Department of History at the United States Military Academy, where he taught survey military history courses, as well as an elective on warfare in the 19th century in both Europe and America, and was promoted to assistant professor uh, his first book, Under the Shadow of Napoleon, French Influence on the American Way of Warfare from the War of 1812 to the Outbreak of World War II was published in April 2012 from New York University Press. Uh, Dr. Benora continues to research and publish as part of the Messina Society, obviously, here we are, uh, and the International Napoleonic Society while continuing to serve in the U.S. Army on active duty. And I should say that he was one of the few officers who could sport a beret with class when that was the uh, standard headgear. So <laughs> without further ado, Mike, uh, the floor is yours. Good morning, and thank you for that introduction. Uh, I have to say about the beret, I don't take a lot of credit for that. Uh, I had some special forces, uh, non-commissioned officers who came in and molded it onto my head uh, so that I wouldn't get it wrong. They didn't want me embarrassing them. Uh, good morning. Uh, so my paper is going to look at the representatives on mission to the Army uh, of the Alps in Italy. Uh, from 1792 to 1793, which is slightly different from the, uh, the title in the program. Uh, and I, I changed that time frame not only because of the limits of a 20 minute presentation, but uh, November 1792 through June 1793 provided uh, enough uh, documentary evidence to outline three reasonably separate periods in the way the representatives on mission uh, conducted their operations, their words and actions, so that I could draw out some of the nuances of the period, uh, which is really the value of, of this particular uh, paper. Uh, to understand the process of the revolution outside of Paris requ requires an examination of the representatives on mission because they are the one, they are how the convention implemented executive authority throughout the departments. The missions to incorporate new territories into France on the southeastern frontier demonstrates how these representatives understood their missions and carried out their duties in a far more nuanced manner than normally described in the secondary literature. In the first phase from November 1792 through May 1793, 
The focus was on reorganization, incorporation, and institutionalization of the revolution. However, as reactionary forces began to resist Parisian leadership, the second period from May through June shows how the missions became more focused on imposing order and improving internal security. Uh, and in fact, uh, the last part of my paper will discuss the initial uh, Federalist uprising in Lyon and the response by the representatives on mission uh, to that area. Thus, an initial focus on the Department of Mont Blanc and the Army of the Alps becomes widened to include the Department of the Alps Maritimes and the combination of the armies of the Alps and the Army of Italy, which leads to the initial responses to the Federalist uprising in Lyon. Although these trends started before 1792 and they continued well after June of 1793, this discrete period uh, really highlights uh, the different ways the representatives on mission uh, operated and uh, understood their duties and implemented them. In, 17, in September 1792, the Army of the Alps occupied the Duchy of Savoy. And on 29 November 1792, the convention sent representatives Philibert Simon, I, I apologize for my French pronunciation up front. The longer I am from an academic position, the worse and worse my already insufficient French gets. So please give me some, uh, 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 cut me some slack. Uh, represents Philibert Simon, Henry Gregory, Marie-Jean Herault de Seychelles, and Gregory Marie Jagot uh, on a mission to organize the Duchy of Savoy into the Department of Mont Blanc with its corresponding districts and cantons. This mission included authorities with regards to the, to the supply, deployment, and operations of the Army of the Alps and its new commander, Francois Kellerman, the hero of the Battle of Albany. They were greeted in Chambéry with revolutionary fervor and set about organizing the department as quickly as possible. The initial reports demonstrated a significant amount of ideological and political support in Savoy for France and for becoming part of the French Republic. By 31 January, the representatives had mostly completed their work. They had made uh, Chambéry the department capital and organized the rest of the department into seven districts, 83 cantons with a population of 424,000. They reported on uh, how they consolidated existing law uh, with the laws of revolutionary France and the Republic, with the establishment of assemblies and the process for elections uh, to the convention for representatives from the de department to the convention, uh, which were underway at the time. They also provided an, an interesting look at the problems associated with funding this reorganization uh, with using uh, the assignats. Uh, and this will be a recurring theme throughout the paper as uh, the representatives on mission are constantly dealing with attempting to implement assignats as currency and the resistance they're getting uh, in the countryside. Similar to the rest of France, uh, there was that resistance to purchase anything and they, they were constantly asking uh, for livre and hard currency for most of the purchases they had to make. This slowed down the work in Mont Blanc, but it didn't provide significant delays. At the same time, the representatives on mission were involved with the external and internal security of the department uh, as armed force would be used for both really. Uh, the representatives uh, made a number of requests to the convention for supplies and arms for the Army of the Alps. They described uh, the poor conditions of the troops, their lack of supply, their, uh, their limited number, as well as uh, kind of intelligence reports uh, across the border uh, for Piedmont Piedmontese preparations, and the growing anti-revolutionary sentiment among the local elites that remain behind in the department. This resulted in several appeals to Paris for more arms and materiel to improve the overall health of the army. The representatives also made observations on the economic, economic state of the department, and reported their activities in trying not only to support the civilian population, but to consolidate the remaining military supplies for use by the Army of the Alps. In addition to the military problems the representatives identified, they kept reporting on increasing amounts of resistance uh, in Mont Blanc. They identified elements both in and out of municipal governments that either failed to enthusiastically support the convention, espoused the return of the representatives of the King of Sardinia, who had recently controlled the Duchy of Savoy, or both. 
While this resistance did not lead to violence or uprising, there were incidents of stolen military stores uh, to arm the, mili the, arm the population against uh, the representatives. Uh, these incidents and the response from the local elites demonstrate, demonstrated the difficulties uh, facing the integration of Mont Blanc into France. Uh, and this was in a population that was generally speaking supportive of the revolution and the republic. As the efforts of the representatives on mission uh, in Mont Blanc progressed, the convention issued additional directives to them to send uh, Gregory and Jago to continue the work of organizing a new department to Nice to organize the newly designated Department of the Alps Maritimes. This is a good place to evaluate what representatives on missions looked like uh, in this early period. Uh, there was not a deliberate uh, system for exerting that national control outside of Paris, so the convention identified problem areas and dispatched representatives on mission to deal with them. So the four representatives sent initially to Mont Blanc provides a good example of this uh, because they were provided authority over the Army of the Alps, but uh, in 1792 there were already three representatives on mission uh, designated to the Army of the Alps. And those three remained in position uh, throughout this entire period. So now there are seven representatives uh, on mission to the Army of the Alps. Uh, and, and as I'll talk about a little later in the paper, um, this is fine in this early period. There actually seems in the Army of the Alps to be a reasonable amount of cooperation both amongst the representatives and with the Army and the new commander Kellerman. Uh, however, when crises begin to occur, uh, and I'll talk about it later, but in Lyon, there are three representatives detailed directly to Lyon, and then two of the army uh, representatives with the Army of the Alps go in to assist, that's five, uh, and then uh, when Robert Lindette gets sent from the com uh, Committee of Public Safety, uh, that's, another, that's six representatives dealing with the same incident. And you really begin to see each of these groups of representatives begin conducting their own policy. So you'll get conflicting guidance and decrees and messages sent back to the convention. Uh, it actually contributes to counter -revolutionary, uh, the counter-revolutionary movements in the area. The experiences of the, the Department of the Alps was important ways different than that in Mont Blanc. Uh, in September, 1792, the Army of Italy seizes Nice. It takes the Army of Italy several more months to establish control over the, uh, the Alps Maritime, uh, the mountain range, and the coastline east of Menton, which provides enough uh, territory to organize a department. This is important, important to the revolution and the convention because they want to incorporate Nice as soon as possible uh, so that they get uh, some economic benefits and access to the, uh, uh, to the port of Nice. Uh, so, Gregory and Jago get there in the middle of February, 18 February. Uh, they begin to implement the same sort of reorganization they had successfully executed uh, in uh, Mont Blanc. Uh, but this is a different, uh, Alps Maritime is different in that 40% uh, of the cantons don't speak French, they speak Italian. So the representatives are issuing their decrees in, in both languages, French and Italian. There are also a number of French dialects that are spoken in the region uh, that provide them no end of problems with uh, effective communication. Uh, there's, there's an interesting series of these decrees, not really decrees, but communications kind of pamphlets where the representatives are trying to assure the Catholic Italians that uh, the revolution is not going to eliminate the church uh, and that uh, they're going to have their religion uh, as much of it as they want. Although, while that's going on, uh, Gregory and Jago identify a lack of revolutionary spirit. So uh, while in the uh, Mont Blanc, there was kind of a popular support uh, that existed, there really isn't much of that uh, in Alps Maritime. So while there's an emerging revolutionary cadre of Republicans, there's also a significant presence of emigres and royalists uh, that are on the ground and not particularly happy or impressed with the change in, in uh, government. 
So uh, in addition to that, Piedmontese troops uh, currently occupied some of the cantons, an area that France uh, determined would be necessary for the department to be functional. So the Army of Italy was continuing uh, to conduct small skirmishes and operations to consolidate French control of the department. Um, throughout the month of March in 1793, Efforts in the House Maritime reflected the attempt to integrate the department without resorting to force. The representatives identified part of the problem stemming from the actions of the French troops uh, in the Army of Italy under the command of General uh, Anselm during the initial occupation as having engendered this counter-revolutionary spirit. They did a number of kind of what we would consider public outreach attempts. Uh, there's a story of a Captain Regat uh, who was in command of a battalion uh, when stationed in the town of Sondagnes, uh, shared the rations of his company with the inhabitants to prevent starvation and to win revolutionary adherence, to really make a kind of hearts and minds attempt. Uh, in the same letter to the convention, the representatives describe uh, tales of individual Republican support, but in the same letter, they identified local administrators in Monaco and Nice with whom they used their authority to uh, remove from office. Uh, and again, I want to point out that these representatives were immensely committed to the revolution. In fact, uh, Gregory uses this language uh, that I love, the revolutionary movement, which rejects half measures and half patriots. Uh, and he uses that as a uh, rationale to remove these people from office, even though they weren't in open uh, rebellion or hadn't violated any laws. Even with these internal pressures by the 4th of April, uh, the Alps Maritime was organized into 20 cantons and 96 communes, making it the smallest in France. Uh, and they established a commercial tribunal in Nice, again, to uh, connect the port of Nice and the economic activities to the Republic. Uh, they reported uh, they were also conducting elections uh, and uh, establishing assemblies, even while the Army of Italy was continuing to expand control. With the reorganization of Mont Blanc complete and Alps Maritimes fully underway, uh, the representatives on mission to the southeastern frontier changed their focus and demeanor as the revolution was changing in the countryside. It's surprising from the correspondence, uh, the speed at which the language uh, changed that the representatives used. Uh, an early example of this uh, in April when the convention declares Du Maurier a traitor, uh, this immediately puts uh, Kellerman uh, into a position of suspicion because of his relationship with Dumoyer. In fact, uh, in 16 April, Representative Herald leads a group uh, of representatives and local officials uh, to Kellerman uh, into his headquarters and his house. Uh, it's this, uh, the full story, it's a very public kind of shaming moment where uh, they bring Kellerman out uh, while he's at a meal, uh, they empty the house and, and Kellerman encourages the representatives to go through all of his correspondence, which they do for about the period of four to six hours. They read every scrap of paper in the place uh, and conclude that Kellerman is not uh, fomenting any sort of counter-revolutionary moment and he's still uh, as committed to the revolution uh, as he had been. But this moment by Herald provides this kind of example. He individually provides an example of this, of this tension with attempting to uh, institute revolutionary control in the departments. Uh, he communicate, he's uh, the instigation of the suspicion of Kellerman. He communicates with the representatives in Lyon uh, to keep Kellerman uh, under suspicion. They're the ones that initially seize some of his correspondence with Paris and lead to Herald's uh, four hour interrogation of him and his communication. Yet, uh, be, being a reasonable representative, uh, he reads all that correspondence and what he tells the convention is, the general of 20 September has not ceased to deserve the esteem and confidence of his fellow citizens and of the army and that Kellerman is a pure man, a Republican worthy to lead the soldiers of liberty to new victories. However, by the end of April, Herald had established a local committee of general surveillance to identify counter-revolutionaries uh, in Mont Blanc for imprisonment. But at the same time, he's asking the convention uh, for additional punishments less than death 
because uh, what he's finding is uh, having death as the only punishment he's got, uh, it's making it difficult to get the local represent the local assemblies and administrators uh, to seize anti-revolutionaries, and it's causing an increase in counter-revolutionary tension. Uh, it, it, this is the kind of dichotomy that I saw in the correspondence. He identifies the problem with assignats as a currency to try to make this economic uh, stimulus go, for lack of a better word. And yet uh, his answer is eliminating hard currency entirely and doing kind of a cold turkey change uh, to that economic tool. So this is not a, a half patriot, as Gregory would have said, uh, but Heral demonstrates the kind of pressures that these representatives are under. Now, skipping, because I'm running short of time, uh, I'd like to advance uh, into the situation at Lyon uh, at the end of May. Uh, by this point, all four of the initial representatives I talked about earlier, they have all been re recalled to Paris. Uh, you've got representatives sent directly to the armies, both of Italy and um, of the Alps. And there are still representatives in Lyon deal, uh, dealing with the incidences there. So on the 25th of May, the municipal government in Lyon distributes food stored for the Army of the Alps to avoid rioting. Uh, while this comes, uh, while a calm prevails, it's clear that the sections um, are unhappy because they want to organize according to the laws of the convention. However, uh, the administrative bodies, the assembly, there's a local committee of public safety. They're concerned that if they allow the sections to organize in broad daylight, they're just going to be organizing counter revolutionary tensions. So by 28 May, uh, the Army of the Alps sends two representatives. This, this is what I talked about. Uh, however, the Girondist revolt in Toulon causes, uh, they were also going to send troops, but they caused those troops to be diverted. So there are no troops available to deal with this initial Lyon uprising. Uh, that uprising on the 29th is fomented because the local uh, representatives in Lyon make a declaration that they're going to commit Lyon to raising 6,000 troops to support the suppression of the Vendée. They're going to provide 6 million livres from the city merchants. They're going to expel foreigners from the sections and disarm everyone in Lyon other than uh, troops loyal to the Committee of Public Safety. This causes the sections to rise up. They eliminate revolutionary government, seize the, the rep representatives Nioche and Gautier, um, this causes Lindet to get sent down by the Committee of Public Safety. Uh, and, and this initial movement, this initial problem in Lyon really demonstrates kind of the, the problems these representatives are having to deal with. Because on the, on the, uh, the day later, uh, on the 30th of May, the assemblies uh, are back in power. The sections have stood down. They release the representatives on mission. Uh, and you get in the correspondence, um, Dubois, Croncet, and Albit, who are with the Army of, of the Alps, they immediately start organizing an ex expedition. But Nioche and Gautier, who get released from prison, immediately send correspondence to both the Alps and the convention to be very subdued in their response because they don't want to encourage this counter revolutionary fervor. Uh, so uh, Lindet arrives on the 3rd of June. He's met by the deputies of the sections who have wild conspiracy theories about uh, they think France has been cut in two with a royalist resurgence uh, in addition to the revolution. Um, you know, coming from Paris, kind of at the seat of, of where all the revolution is happening, happening. Lindet is shocked. Um, but at the same time, the Lyon, Lyon knows that its representatives to the convention have been arrested, so they don't recognize Lindet until they get uh, assurances from the convention that everything is going to work out. Uh, Lindet himself says, and, and this is the thing I will end with, um, he also encourages restraint, but his takeaway from the early Lyon days is that what, what the departments and the countryside really need is that convention or is the constitution. He sees that on the ground, what he sees is that the constitution would eliminate all of this trouble and allow all of these departments just to organize themselves. But as it happens, you know, on the ground, Linda can't do anything and he leaves. Uh, so that's where I'll end uh, my presentation. And I just wanna say that 
uh, this is not what I was expecting at all uh, from the secondary literature that I'd read. Um, these are committed, intelligent, competent uh, politicians. They go attempting to address the individual uh, concerns in the departments, all the while uh, supporting the Republic and the re revolution. They're not zealots. They're, they're very pragmatic and they are trying to make the revolution work on the ground. Uh, it just happens that the issues on the ground are largely outside of their ability to address. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you very much, Mike. Appreciate it. Uh, you avoided the video filter uh, penalty. So good job. <laughs> good job. <laughs> well, <clears throat> let, me, uh, let me remind everybody that um, if you have questions uh, uh, for any of these speakers, and we'll deal with questions after all three speak, uh, just uh, send them to me in the chat room, uh, and I will address them uh, in, in order. Um, our next speaker uh, is Dr. Jordan Hayworth, uh, who is an associate professor of military and security studies in the Department of Air Power at Air Command and Staff College. Uh, Dr. Hayworth received his BA from High Point University. Uh, I have known him since he was intellectually knee high to a grasshopper. So to see him a giant now is, is, is rather, I'm beaming with great pride. Uh, although I, I'm waiting to hear his paper. That might change if it's you know not, not normal Hayworth quality, but I doubt it. Um, he received his MA and PhD uh, at the University of North Texas, where he studied under uh, Dr. Michael Legiri, uh, one of the greats, uh, and as a student fellow of the Military History Center at North Texas. Uh, Dr. Hayworth has several publications on the wars of the French Revolution, including his first book, Revolutionary France's War on Conquest in the Rhineland, Conquering the Natural Frontiers, 1792 to 1797, which was published by Cambridge University in the spring 2019, and I think first germinated as a senior seminar paper uh, at High Point University when he was an undergraduate. I want to take a little, little bit of, um, but anyway, uh, currently he's writing a new history of General Jean-Baptiste Jordan and the 1794 Fleurou campaign, uh, and we are waiting in, uh, with great anticipation, Dr. Hayworth, for your paper. All yours. Okay, thank you. It's good to see everybody. I know there is uh, nothing that Dr. Schneid would like more than to assign me a mustache or something while I'm uh, doing this paper. So I'm going to do my best uh, to deny him that treat uh, by trying to come in under 20 minutes. Uh, my paper is uh, Politics, Personality, and Command, Representatives on Mission, and the Careers of General Jordan, Pichigrou, and Osh. In the fall of 1793, the newly formed revolutionary government embarked on a regeneration of France's war effort, which had reached its nadir that summer. In the northern and northeastern theaters of war, this period saw the emergence of generals Jordan, Osh, and Pichegru. The promotion of these generals was not a straightforward, simple process of selection by eminent revolutionaries such as Carnot, Saint-Just, or the war minister Bouchot. In fact, a larger number of lesser known representatives on mission were especially important in the emergence of these men to command and the trajectory of their early careers. Moreover, closely examining this relationship yields significant insight on the revolution's war effort that proves both more complicated and more interesting than is often portrayed. The wildly different trajectories of the early careers of Jordan, Pichegru, and Osh were closely tied to their performances in command and professional merit, but also to their political views and the complex web of personal relationships with the representatives on mission and other administrative agents in their theaters of operation. It has sometimes been portrayed um, that the representatives on mission held in practice truly absolute powers over the army, especially, for example, the Army of the North uh, after General Custine's downfall and execution in the summer and early fall of 1793. If this were true in practice, it would seem to make the generals of these armies little more than military figureheads. But this interpretation proves exaggerated, even in the case of Custine's immediate successor in the Army of the North, the unfortunate General Houchard. On 5 September, Lazar Carnot, who had only recently joined the Committee of Public Safety, set great expectations for General Houchard. Quote, by striking the great blow 
you might bring the war to an end. The rest is up to you to decide, Citizen General. Full of confidence in your military talents, civic duty, and experience, we do not intend to interfere with your movements, and we leave you free to make your own dispositions, Carnot had maintained. But in reality, Houchard never enjoyed complete freedom, nor the confidence of the representatives on mission with the army. In particular, he was suspected by Representative Levazier, a former surgeon and firm Montagnard, most likely because of the general's prior associations with Custine in the Moselle army. Houchard obviously had reason to be fearful. His lackluster victory on 8 September at Honshu did not inspire the committee's confidence. In mounting his self-defense after his arrest, Houchard wrote to Bouchot, the war minister, on 27 September, I am a sans culotte general and have fought since the revolution as a true sans culotte. Though these lines did not save Houchard's life, they and, and some of the other things that he, he said in this letter captured much of the new standards expected of the generals who rose to command at this moment of the terror. As Carnot informed the Northern Army's representatives on the uh, 21st of September, the multitude of traitors to whom the fate of our armies has been entrusted up to this moment must make us attentive to better appreciate the character of the men whom we employ. Thus, much attention would be given to the political allegiances and personalities of the men who would command France's army in this moment of peril. But the real test would be whether they could triumph in command, not in a mediocre style like Houchard at Honshu, but in a manner conforming to Carnot's vision of striking a great blow. From the beginning of his command, General Jordan had already formed a more cordial relationship with the army's various representatives on mission than Houchard ever possessed. Representative Duquesnois, a lawyer whose brother served as a general in the Army of the North, proved especially important in Jordan's rise to command. Beyond displaying talent as a general of brigade and division, Jordan's early political affiliation with the Jacobin Club in his hometown of Limoges earned the trust of the representatives. Still, like Houchard, Jordan understood the dangerous position he was entering, which accounts for his claim that he lacked the talents necessary for such a position. He was soon reminded that it was considered treasonous to reject such a position of responsibility once assigned by the revolutionary government. In his initial actions as commander of the Northern Army, Jordan impressed the representatives as he prepared to defend Malbouge from the coming Allied attack under Prince Coburg. Representatives Elie Lacoste and Pézard reported on 3 October, quote, we are going to offer our opinions to General Jordan, who assembles a force of 45,000 men to relieve Malbouge and make our enemies feel the difference of an army commanded by a patriot. Whether because of his political allegiances, his determined personality, or perceived abilities, Jordan forged a solid partnership with the majority of the army's representatives on mission in his first month in command. In fact, they consistently echoed his own reports to Bouchot and the committee, not only in explaining his operations, but also in alerting the government to serious problems facing the Army of the North. The representatives on mission no longer constantly warned the government of the unreliability of the Army's generals, but instead agreed with General Jordan that it needed as much material support as possible. Of course, the real test for the new commander would be the battle to save Malbouge. Elie Lacoste and Pézard at Arras were pleased that the armies, quote, the army's different columns are marching toward Guise. The last will arrive on the 10th of this month. We expect the happiest success of this movement. Jordan has promised to return victorious. We count on the words of this courageous Republican. Uh, I, this is not, uh, in this paper, I don't intend to review the debate uh, over Jordan's and Carnot's respective uh, responsibility for the French victory at the Battle of Watigny on 15 and 16 October. Uh, 1793. Uh, we could perhaps talk about that in the in, in the uh, Q&A and discussion. But it should be noted that although the Battle uh, of Watigny did save Malbouge, it did not destroy Coburg's army and cannot be considered a more decisive French victory than Honshu. With respect to, to those points, Jordan and the representatives on mission, including Carnot, came under criticism from agents of the Minister of War Bouchot, and the two in particular were Celiez and Berton. The minister's agents speculated to Bouchot that Jordan, quote, feared to displease the national representation. He feared perhaps being denounced by the representatives. And so it was that through a condescension which has always existed between the generals and the representatives, they reciprocally praised each other. 
Nonetheless, the agents respected Jordan for his political loyalties, telling Bouchot, quote, Jordan is pure, and we hope that at last he will be able to deploy the energies of a Republican. In the difficult months that followed, Jordan's personal security benefited from the way he managed to secure the favor both of the representatives on mission and the war ministry's agents, even when those officials engaged in such bureaucratic competition against each other. Tenser relations between Jordan and the revolutionary government occurred in the two months after Watani. On 22 October, Carnot instructed Jordan to finish the campaign, stressing the importance of driving the allies from the frontier of Northern France before the onset of winter. Jordan was able to rely on the representatives on mission to advocate for supplies being design designated to his army. By the beginning of November, however, it became clear to Jordan that an offensive across the Somme was beyond the means of his army at that time. Perhaps surprisingly, he found the representatives on mission with his army in complete agreement. As with logistical and leadership deficits, the representatives tended to view his situation sympathetically. We are here right up against the enemy and our position is not favorable for an attack, Representative Duquenois announced on the 30th. The Sombre River is in front of us. Without this obstacle, we would have already forced the enemy to take flight. However, we must look for ways to overcome this obstacle, which must be overcome. In many ways, this situation appeared quite similar to that which led to Houchard's arrest and execution. Yet Jordan navigated this delicate situation with the continued backing of the representatives. On 4 November, he had threatened his resignation if the committee did not relent in its demands for a major offensive. Despite his outright rejection of their orders, the committee did not declare him destitute. The positive relations that Jordan cultivated with the representatives on mission proved especially important after 12 November when the committee called him to Paris. There is no evidence to suggest that Jordan was recalled at that time as a suspect. Bertrand Barrère actually informed the National Convention that the committee wished to discuss options with Jordan for the uh, plan of campaign. The committee did name General Ferrand the provisional commander in Jordan's absence, but the expectation was for Jordan to return. On the 16th, he presented a plan of campaign, which was backed by Representative Duquenois, and that satisfied Carnot's desires and at least some of the others on the committee. Given all of this, it remains difficult to explain exactly why Jordan did not command the Army of the North at the start of the 1794 campaign. In extremely difficult circumstances, he played a key role in turning the army into a combat effective force and worked better than any general up to that point with the political leaders. Upon his return to the army, he continued to work closely with the representatives. However, there is reason to think that Carnot and others on the committee grew frustrated with Jordan. In a letter of 3 December, Carnot said to him, quote, always new complaints from the communes that according to your first letters, we believe to be safe write to us so that we know what to expect. While many authors have offered various speculations, the documentary record only shows that the committee ordered his and his chief of staff's arrest on the 6th of January, 1794, the decree being written by Carnot and signed by five members of the committee. Jordan received news of his arrest and most likely on 14 January, he defended his conduct before the committee. He specifically remarks in his memoirs that the representatives on mission with his army testified to his zeal and devotion, which played no small part in the committee subsequently canceling his arrest and allowing him to return soon to service, but with another army. Jordan's removal from command might be linked to the circumstances between generals, representatives, and the committee in a different but nearby theater of war. In Alsace, the two French armies of the Moselle and the Rhine had undergone an even more tumultuous turnover of commanders in the fall of 1793 before responsibility fell to generals Osh and Pichegru, both previously obscure and inexperienced like Jordan. The loss of the Wissembourg lines left the revolutionary government unconvinced of both the civic duty and intelligence of generals such as uh, Beauharnais, uh, Schoenbord, Delaunay, uh, Landremont, and Landremont with the Moselle and Rhine armies, leading to their uh, uh, destitutions by the end of October. At each step of his promotion, General Osh had been supported by various representatives with whom he regularly corresponded. Bold, assertive, and ambitious, Osh saw the representatives as partners in the revolutionary struggle, but also as allies for his rise to command. 
After Honshu, he put himself forward to the committee to lead an invasion of Great Britain. And he offered representatives Triard and Berlier a comprehensive critique of the current methods of waging war. The Moselle Army's new commander proved adept at overcoming friction points with the Army's representatives, which ultimately allowed him to gain their favor and admiration. Representative Hintz, for example, helped Osh identify reliable officers, but maintained that the Army, quote, needs a good purge. Yet the representative and general were not in conflict on this. Quote, I believe that Osh, general of the Moselle, will do well. He inspires confidence, he has courage, views, and he could not be an intriguer, hence wrote to the committee on the 12th of November. Although Osh's personality eventually led him to trouble, his partnership with the Moselle Army's representatives appears genuine, perhaps to the point where their loyalty to him led them into conflict with the Rhine Army. Quote, General Osh, having planned an expedition, wishes to have representatives of the people with him, uh, Risho and Subrani reported on the 14th raising the alarm about delays in the campaign due to the slow arrival of promised reinforcements from the Army of the Rhine. The representatives preemptively defended Osh from potential criticism from the Rhine army and could not have been more glowing in their assessment of him. Quote, General Osh shows the greatest ardor and the greatest activity for the execution of a project that holds the fate of the departments of the Rhine. The advance of the two armies to Zweibrücken in late November, saw an initial controversy over who commanded these armies, which reflected a larger contrast in competing command styles and the ideal relationship between generals and representatives on mission. General Pichagru's appointment to command the Rhine Army brought him into close contact with representatives Saint-Just and Philippe-Francois-Joseph Lebas. On 21 November, those two representatives claimed that Pichagru commanded the two armies in chief a decision that was actually never fully resolved. With respect to Ocean Pisha Group, the representatives on mission showed great affinity for the generals they were specifically attached to monitor and assist, very much like the representatives who worked closely with Jordan in the Northern Army. In the case of Ocean Pisha Group, however, the only characteristic they shared was lack of experience. Otherwise, they could not have been more different. Where Osh was brash and assertive, Pisha Group has been described as, quote, guarded and reserved, a man who possibly favored being in the background while the representatives played a more prominent role. Yet while this appears to have been Saint-Just's ideal for general-in-chief, Pichagru's style did not find favor with many other representatives in Alsace who found Osha's leadership more satisfactory and promising of success. Yet from the very beginning of, of his command, Pichagru did receive positive reviews from the various representatives with whom he came into contact in the Rhine Army. As with Ocean Jordan, proximity in the conduct of operations seems to have done as much to bring representatives and generals closer together as to divide them. In Osha's case, this proved true even in the face of the defeat at Kaiserslautern in late November. On 2 December, the representatives informed the committee, quote, we must ensure that this movement, doubtless less advantageous for the Republic than the capture of Kaiserslautern, does not prevent us from honoring the talent of the general who directed it. The courage shown by General Osh sustains our hope, the committee commented on 5 December after learning of the defeat. The purge called for by the committee and executed by the representatives also did not divide Osh from the representatives with the Moselle Army. In fact, he assisted them with their efforts, even as representatives Richaud and Subrani ended their mission and were were replaced in early December by representatives Baldo, previously a doctor, and Jean-Baptiste Lacoste, himself a lawyer and justice of the peace. Conflict between representatives and generals arose as the two armies of the Moselle and Rhine came into closer cooperation with one another in the Wissenborg campaign in December. The representatives on mission with Osha's Moselle army proved even harsher than the frustrated general in their criticism of the Rhine army and its commander. On 21 December, Baldo and Lacoste fed up with, quote, the impotence that the Rhine army causes by its inactivity, declared that the more we examine the conduct of the generals, the more convinced we are that the stagnation of our troops is due to their incapacity. They held no punches, even against Saint-Just's favorite, quote, Pichagru, who commands the Rhine army, shows neither activity, audacity, nor the strength of a general. He commands without worrying about obedience. He has no means of making a plan, nor the will to carry out that of another. They in fact recommended that the committee remove Pichagru from his command, 
uh, commenting that as he is a patriot, he will be given an inferior position, which will better suit him and the circumstances. While critics criticizing Pichigrou, the representatives Baldo and Lacoste held up Osh as a model commander as they assigned him commander in chief of both armies without the approval of the committee or their other representatives. After meeting with Saint-Just and Lebas, the two representatives informed the committee, quote, we are in agreement on Pichigrou's public virtues, but not at all on his military talents, which we still view as absolutely unsuitable for army command. The talents that Osh displayed today confirms us more and more in the advantageous idea with, uh, we had of him. And we can only congratulate ourselves so far on the preference we have for him over Pichigrou. Saint-Just and Lebas, learning of Baldo and Lacoste's promotion of Osh, noted, quote, the circumstance was delicate. We will act cautiously. They hoped that whatever the outcome of the dispute, dispute, the committee would, quote, do justice to Pichigrou. We will do everything possible to restrain all the passions. It is impossible that this blow has not emerged from an entry to divide and discourage our triumphant armies. Ultimately, the committee took a moderate, pragmatic approach that showed confidence in both generals and both sets of representatives. Carnot and Barrer informed Baldo and Lacoste of their admiration for Pichigrou and that, quote, whatever may be said of General Osh, in whom we have great confidence, we believe that he will accept with reluctance the command of the two united armies, for these generals have hitherto seemed to us to act in concert and mutual esteem, a judgment that was not true. To Saint-Just and Lebas, a group of committee members, including Maximilien Robespierre, uh, Biol Varen, and uh, Barrere, but not including Carnot, wrote on the 29th, quote, we like you value and love Pichigrou's good citizenship and talents. On the 1st of January, the committee ordered that, quote, the operations will be coordinated between the generals in chief and the representatives. Clearly political disagreements, growing personal animosity and sincere beliefs about Pichigrou's inadequacy as commander meant that the military and political leaders of the Moselle army would not let the matter rest there. Although they seemed to reconcile in a letter on 30 December, the next few uh, weeks saw their most stinging criticisms yet as Pichigrou started to gain credit for the relief of Landau. Osh wrote to Bouchot on 31 December, quote, when it comes to making war, I only believe one thing, and that is that everyone must be constantly at their post, an indirect criticism of Pichigrou. On 3 January, Baldo and Lacoste could not restrain themselves. Writing to the committee, quote, you say that General Pichigrou is active and intelligent. One is not active when one does not know the positions of the army he commands. Pichigrou was known only at his headquarters, which were always at least four leagues from the army. One is not intelligent when one cannot make plans, when one agrees with everyone, and when one gives contradictory orders in the same day and at the same time. Pichigrou is a patriot, but a cold and inanimate patriot. His presence extinguishes the ardor of the soldier instead of igniting him. Osh, whom the representatives continued to praise, expressed himself most strongly in an extensive letter to Bouchot on 8 January, by which uh, other matters had transpired. But he said, nonetheless, quote, for Pichigrou to say he was in command of an army, he has to actually be seen there. Most historians are in agreement with Osh and the representatives with his army that Pichigrou contributed little to French success in Alsace in 1793, though many credit Saint-Just with improving discipline and pushing the generals forward in the same way that some accounts still credit Carnot as the true victor of Watteny. In reality, no single individual made the sole difference and victories in the North and the Northeast to the extent that they can be attributed to French success rather than allied failure occurred as a result of combined efforts by military and political leaders, the latter of whom have been largely obscured by the names Jordan, Osh, Pichigrou, Carnot, and Saint-Just. The narrative has also been shaped by the committee's 6 January 1794 decision placing Jordan in a state of arrest, retaining Osh as commander of the Moselle army, but not as generalissimo of the two armies in Alsace, and placing Pichigrou in command of the Army of the North. In early March, once Jordan had escaped the guillotine and returned to Limoges, a letter arrived from the Minister of War Bouchot asking him to leave his haberdashery and to take command of the Army of the Moselle. Because of delays in his invasion of Trier and bickering with Carnot, which transpires over January and February 1794, Osh was sent to the Army of Italy 
where he was duly arrested by General Dumerbion and the representatives on mission with that army following the committee's orders. And I, I had a longer uh, kind of assessment of these three commanders, uh, but I know that I am running short on time and to avoid having an embarrassing mustache on my face, I will just conclude uh, by saying that of these three generals, I think that Jordan perhaps actually best suited the moment as we see consistently with his command in, in this first moment of his, of his command, but also in the 1794 campaign, that he was able to get along uh, really with whomever he needed to, including at very important moments, both Carnot and also Saint-Just in the 1794 campaign, um, but also many other representatives um, who uh, pretty much all consistently uh, praised him uh, for his conduct. But this is interesting because at the same time, he would also on several uh, important occasions risk his personal safety uh, in defying the committee's orders and, uh, and, and advocating for other courses of action when those in power needed to, be, needed to be told the truth. His arrival in command of the Moselle army uh, in March, 1794 pr proved fortuitous for the French as the 1794 campaign commenced in a manner that proved frustrating for Carnot, the representatives on mission and the other members of the Committee of Public Safety in part, I believe, because the wrong commander, Pichegru, had been chosen to lead the most important army. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Hayworth. Uh, fortunately, I had trouble finding the mustache, so you were able to <laughs> avoid the, the, the penalty. All right, our, our uh, final speaker uh, is Paul Streidelmeyer. Uh, who received his MA in Modern European History in 2011 from the University of North Texas, where he focused on the insurrection in the Vendée. He has presented multiple times at the Consortium on the Revolutionary Era and is currently working on a chapter about the representatives on mission in the Vendée and is translating Gen General Benningson's memoirs of the 1806-1807 campaign in Poland. That will be quite valuable to have an English translation of that account. So very good. Well, uh, Paul, we throw it over to you. All right. Well, I'm duly frightened, uh, Dr. Schneid, so I will be very careful to stay within 20 minutes. Um, I also should have probably renamed my paper title a little bit. It's Maintaining and Restraining Force During the Peace Process, uh, the Representatives on Mission in the Vendée from the summer of 1794 to the fall of 1795. But I also should have added uh, that overused phrase, um, cultivating hearts and minds, because that's a lot of what they're doing is trying to figure out uh, how to get the population back into the fold at this point. In the spring of 1795, the Republic faced a now seemingly endless war in the Vendée. The representatives sent to end the war faced a challenging double task. They had to convince the rebel chiefs to stop fighting while convincing the people to stop supporting the chiefs. Meanwhile, they had to maintain an increasingly anarchic and threadbare army of the West. Ultimately, the representatives were able to separate people from their chiefs by creating a durable, popular political settlement at the peace agreements of La Journée and Saint Florent in the spring of 1795. So too, they were able to stabilize the army after General Perot's disastrous campaign, but they were basically unable to improve it. And the war would not end definitively until General Osh, first of all, got out of prison and then took command and was able to capture the two remaining rebel leaders, Charette and Stoufflé. By the spring of 1794, the army was in tatters. General Thoreau was still pursuing his disastrous and savage policy of the infernal columns, requisitioning all that he could, burning the rest, uh, displacing the population wholesale and routine, routinely engaging in mass killings that at least bordered on genocidal. On the whole, it was a period that uh, Anne Roland, Anne Roland Bolestro characterizes as a generalocracy, when the soldiers were free to act with relatively little oversight. But the policy was failing badly, and finally in April 1794, the city of Luzon rebelled against the widening circle of repression and arrested the local commander, General Uche, and even executed one of his subordinates. While the representatives reversed the city's actions, it still helped end the infernal columns. In April, the CPS also withdrew troops from the Army of the West for other theaters, 
And in May, it replaced Thoreau with Vimeu as commander in chief of the Army of the West. In May and April, the CPS sent replacement representatives Bo and Ingrand. At this point, the army was broken, weak, and directionless. On 14 June 1794, Vimeu reported that he had less than 26,000 active forces at his disposal. He suggested, and he was not the first, that the Vendee would stretch into a protracted struggle like France had fought on Corsica. On the other hand, on one occasion, the rebel chiefs Charette, Sapineau, and Stoufflet were able to jointly muster over 6,300 men for an attack on Chalon. Republican soldiers were still poorly equipped and holding an extensive perimeter. It was also clear that the war was depriving France of important agricultural resources. Already in May 1794, the CPS was diverting its attention to this question. And on 21 June, the Commission of Agriculture and the Arts, one of the commissions created that spring and subordinate to the CPS, announced its intention to send columns of soldiers to register locals and oversee agriculture. It still resorted to the rhetoric of peasants misled by priests and nobles and promised war to the death if there was resistance. Still, it was a radical shift in two respects. First, it focused on strengthening agriculture, a far cry from Thoreau's goal of requisitioning or burning everything he could. Not that this was without tensions. Bo simultaneously brought in outside help uh, in the form of labor for agriculture in the, mil in the military Vendee, but also firmly believed that military action could not be delayed until after the harvest, because by then Charette would have all the locals freed from the harvest, and Bo uh, estimated that to be about 12,000 potential fighters. Second, the government started to really refer deliberately to ignoring the past actions of individuals. This can be seen as an early part of a deliberate official policy of forgetting inherent to many peacemaking processes. The specific policy was relatively toothless because it lacked support from local military leaders and the representatives, but the representatives would use much the same policy throughout the summer. Again, they did promote the idea of an amnesty, but not for leadership. So you get a situation like that when a Vendean chief, Andre Baumler, was willing and trying to surrender along with 3,000 rebels, but was executed per the directives of Bowen and Grand to take a hard line against leadership. Such operations, uh, military operations as were executed also proved that the army was still capable of horrible atrocities and actions that summer by General Luchet helped, along with Baumler's execution, end the surrender process of those 3,000. So the summer ended uh, with a deadlock, but it was not pointless. Roland Bolestro insists that peacemaking should be viewed as a process and that the spring and summer, while inconclusive, still marked an important and deep critical turn toward a peace policy. The next round of representatives included four of the major players, Dornier and Guy Ardenne in August, and Auger and Bézard in September. These were fa still fairly strong Republicans. Dornier is classed by Biard as part of the plane, but he was only part of the plane by like a hair's breadth. He was, I think he was really more of a, of a Montagnard. Uh, uh, Guy Ardenne was clear Montagna, an ex-priest and a regicide, and Bézard was also a regicide. Nevertheless, it was a start of a trend by which the next batch would be a majority plain. The CPS issued sweeping new instructions on 16 August 1794 as this new batch of representatives was selected and dispatched. And the representatives were to be the main vehicle of enforcement for all of the directives. There was to be a major purge of commanders. The army was to be placed in mutually supporting camps with constant movement between them. The plan now was to constrict the, Von, uh, constrict the Vendee, slowly squeezing it to death by moving the camps in ever closer circles. These camps were to be isolated from the civilian population. Roadsides were to be cleared of brush and trees. Pardon was to be granted, but only to those who had, quote, not accepted a rank, end quote, among the rebels. And with the new representatives, came a new Commander-in-Chief, General Alexandre Dumas, who was appointed on 7 September 1794. Neither the representatives nor Dumas were sanguine about the Army's prospects. 
The army was reported to have 70,000 men. They put the number at 45,000, of which 17 to 18,000 were sick, and barely 15,000 were well armed. And they were badly overstretched again, still to find, uh, form a cordon. Dumas put the effectives after inspection even lower, claiming he had only 26,148 fighting men. Fighting was continuous and the camp system was not working either. Instead, they suggested moving a strong force to the center of the Vendée, but they had to complete a lot of work for, uh, first. The army needed to be fully rebuilt, supplied, and retrained. But the new representatives had a great deal of promise. In general, the post Tarot representatives spent vastly more time touring camps and the theater of operations, so they were actually there to see what was happening. Dornier, for example, sampled food, he visited hospitals, he attended, inspe attended inspections and spoke to the troops. On 3 September, Dornier and Gerardin purged several officers, including Generals Uche and Grignan, two of the worst commanders or worst offenders from the infernal columns. On 11 October, they similarly relieved the general uh, commanding the camp of La Rulière, General Jacob, after it was overrun by Charette. The general was apparently known for spending too much time in Nantes and amusing himself in the company of ladies. It was in this context that Carnot and representatives from the military Vendée began to hammer out plans for a more durable amnesty. The Army of the uh, West also received a fitting commander, the old sweat General Conclot, who had been removed from command of the Army of the Coasts of Brest in the Vendée in September 1793 along with his chief of staff, General Grouchy, for being a noble. He received command on 9 October 1794 with command over the whole perimeter of the theater and promises of reinforcements from General Osh and the Army of the Pyrenees. Finally, on 2 December 1794, a total amnesty was declared in the West, leaders included, and local representatives were sent to oversee the process. The amnesty helped in one major respect, by including leaders that addressed earlier shortcomings of other efforts. Where before the challenge had been to restore civilian trust in the army, meaning discipline, uh, while still maintaining an armed presence, the, army ad the amnesty added the challenge of coaxing the rebels into a real peace, again while maintaining an armed presence. One pragmatic measure, clearly nudge, nudge, wink, wink, was essentially to pay off the rebel chiefs. Dornier records that Carnot told him not to be concerned about how much he had to spend, but to just do it. He not so gently said, quote, pay them. Many of the minor rebel chiefs received tens of thousands of livres, and Bernier, the political force in Stauffle's region, got away with a cool 100,000. Roland Bolestro is also careful to underscore the importance of personal contact between the rebel chiefs and the representatives. Indeed, the representatives made initial contact with Charette via Charette's sister, and they later contacted Stoufflé through a former acquaintance. After that, especially with Charette, written contact was routine. Nor was there any question of who represented the Republic. In the conference at La Journée, Conclot was conspicuously subordinate, and at Saint Florent, he was totally absent. At least by Dornier's account, the policy of forgetting remained critical. In December, the Roms did, or the representatives did not include priests or emigres in the amnesty, but agreed that, quote, the convention does not want their blood. When someone mentioned the atrocities committed during the war, Dornier replied, quote, there were those on both sides and that it was not necessary to speak of or ever remember them. Two representatives in particular uh, characterized polar opposites and in their own way created real tension among the representatives. Godin was a fiery representative that had once been the mayor of Les Sables d'Alone. For reasons as yet unclear to me, he managed to break off from the other representatives who centered on the Loire and went to Sable where he threw all of his effort into remaining on hostile terms with the rebels. At one point, the other representatives had to countermand a military action he had ordered in late January. And at multiple points, Grouchy would blame Godin for helping to reignite the, uh, the war after the Peace of La Jonnet. Ruel, by contrast, was widely considered optimistic to the point of delusion and friendly to the rebels to the point of poor taste. But he was in many respects the head of the representative council responsible for the peace. 
His reports were typically padded with praise of the wonderful state of things, the quality of the army, the cooperation of the rebel leaders. He was, to say the least, not liked by his fellow representatives. Now, it's hard to know whether or not Ruel was stupid, deluded, canny, or so egotistical that he had to believe the peace process for which he was the most visible figure had worked. My inclination is to say that he was at least in part canny. Yes, he was lying through his teeth, but he was probably thereby hoping to bring people to the table. Someone as perceptive as Dornier felt in January 1795 that further fighting would cost the Republic another 25,000 casualties. In that light, maybe the representatives felt, or at least the majority felt, that peace was simply a necessity. And Ruel was basically alone in vaunting the peace as definitive. Most of the others, like Dornier, were aware that it was precarious, a starting, a starting point and potentially a cover by the rebels to rebuild. But despite the vituperations hurled at him, he was largely responsible for making the terms of La Jeunet stick as the foundation of the long-term settlement of the war. And the agreements of La Jeunet and Saint Florent themselves were shockingly generous uh, and almost wholly decided upon by the representatives on the spot. It granted liberty of religion, de facto exemption from conscription, large indemnities for reconstruction of the area, it promised to honor the assignats and other financial commitments made by the rebels up to 2 million livres, but that was increased. It granted extensive restitution of confiscated property and even devised a mean of, means of splitting crops sown by remaining locals on refugee land between the two. And it also included um, a clause that Volcherette and Stoffle could keep 2,000 armed followers uh, at government expense to constitute, uh, constitute a territorial guard. In a very smart move, the representatives actually allowed a number of minor chiefs to sign on to the peace agreement between the two major conferences, rather than demanding block submissions. With the peace apparently settled on 17 June, the CPS recalled the majority of the representatives from the West as a whole. And it would appear that this occurred under heavy pressure from General Osh. After the agreements of La Jeunet and Saint Florent, the situation was decidedly mixed. North of the Loire, Chouannery continued almost unabated. In Charette's region, low-scale violence continued, uh, continued and re-erupted in the summer, mainly because of royalist efforts associated with Quiberon, rather than Godin's abrasiveness, though that didn't help. Despite Grouchy's angry assessment that the peace had interrupted the army's chance to finally wipe out Stoffle, the latter's area basically remained calm until returning to the fight under pressure from the Comte d'Artois in January 1796. So all this brings us back to the two key questions. Were the peace efforts of 1794 and 1795 successful? And did the representatives help or hurt Republican efforts in the Vendée at this time? Chassin, one of the greatest chroniclers, but also a hardcore Republican, had no doubts that this was a wasted opportunity and that it only gave the rebels time to rearm. And that's a pretty common position among your, you know, your third Republic, Republican uh, uh, historians. Nor was the army anywhere near peak performance. Indeed, the army was in terrible shape. It had lost more troops, but of course, this was partially out of the need to respond to the emigre inv invasion at Quiberon. By August 1795, Grouchy, chief of staff for the Army of the West, put the army strengths army strength at 28,000 max. Other than sending troops to Brittany, he blames high rates of desertion, noting that uh, many of the units in the Vendée were drafted from the surrounding area and so deserted more easily. Grouchy recounts two battalions deserting wholesale, one of which was appropriately called Friends of the Republic. Nor was Grouchy sanguine about discipline, noting that the military commissions meted out weak punishment, if any, and that the soldiers see pillage, quote, see pillage as their heritage, and as traitors, those who would wish to spare those in the Vendée who are not armed. Nor were the rebels truly subdued. In mid-August 1795, the English landed supplies near saint gilles north of Les Sables, and Charette was able to muster a staggering 12,000 men 
to protect this operation. In at least one case, a new representative, Koshon, replaced a general in order to stem the problem of indiscipline, but it did continue. But the representatives were much weaker and their time was rapidly drawing to a close and completing the task would fall to the army. So it was that Cochon Laparant, one of the last representatives wrote that the army was in disarray. Quote, we will kill, we will be killed without accomplishing anything. We need a man of both war and peace who is indulgent and terrible. If you have one like this, send him to us immediately and make him a dictator. End quote. On 29 August, General Osh was given command of the Army of the West, and on 14 September 1795, the CPS issued an arete giving him full control that the representatives could not touch. But going back to Roland Bolestro's vision of pacific pacification as a process, it seems undeniable that without the representatives, without the agreements of 1795, OSHA's task would have been much more challenging. By creating a durable settlement that satisfied the average Vendean, giving them back their religion and exempting them from conscription. Lost my spot. The, Rom, uh, the representatives had left OSHA the sole task of dealing with Charette and Stoufle. And as we've seen, the representatives dispatched in the summer of 1795 further restrain the military force that the immediately pre-Thermidor representatives were willing to use. For all the gargantuan flaws of the agreements of 1795, it meant that any subsequent rebel resistance would ultimately be doomed, like uh, Emil Gabary said, like a, a lamp without oil. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Uh, thank you, Jordan. Thank you, Mike. Uh, we now will uh, open for questions. Uh, people have been sending questions. Uh, there are several for all three of you. I think maybe we'll start with those uh, and then we'll, we'll go to the couple few questions for, for each individual. Um, and as we have this, uh, this, this question and answer, if there are others who have questions, please continue to uh, send your questions. Um, I think uh, one, one comes from, uh, 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 and forgive me if I'm mispronouncing your name, Paul Zemianis. Uh, he says, how, uh, for all three of you, one, uh, uh, how many representatives in mission had military experience or education, uh, military education? And was this a consideration when they were selected or dispatched to the various armies? Uh, doesn't matter. I can, to I, can, uh, I can start with that. Okay. Um, it was not, uh, certainly not the majority of representatives on mission that had military experience. Um, at least I, I'm, I'm speaking with, with respect to the, the armies that my paper uh, was concerned with, which is the representatives that I know most of the biographies of. Um, but it was, uh, it, 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 it was the case that some of the representatives um, did have uh, some military experience, but not, not anything that was extensive. I, I'm, I'm not aware of one with these armies that was a long service um, professional soldier, but in the same way that, uh, you know, Jordan himself had a uh, brief military experience in the French army, served with, uh, you know, served in the French army in the War of American Independence. Uh, I believe Subrani uh, had a uh, brief military experience, uh, and he worked with, with Ocean, the Moselle. Um, and there were a few others that had, that had short stints, uh, within the French army as well. Um, so there, there was some, uh, background, some, some military background for, for some of the representatives, but on the whole, uh, they were your typical, uh, cast of revolutionaries, uh, you know, lawyers, um, doctors, merchants, um, but you know, with the case of Jordan, that that shows that that did not make them necessarily less militarily experienced than some of the people that became generals in the Army of the Republic, uh, the Army of the Republic either. Um, and Saint Just's father also had military experience as well, so there was some uh, military background in his family. Um, Mike. Yeah, the representatives uh, I worked with were clerics and lawyers. There wasn't a, uh, a military veteran amongst them. 
Well, there were two that had a passing familiarity uh, that I know of. One of them was a very minor role. It may have been, I believe it was actually just as a National Guard commander. Uh, and then another one had been a military surgeon, but that's it. Thank you. Um, another question for all of you. Uh, this comes from, I, I believe his name is uh, Jonathan Abel. Uh, and uh, his question is, uh, what was the uh, interaction between the representatives on mission uh, and the supply companies in the armies, both from uh, in the rear area and the enemy areas? Let's start with Mike, maybe, on that. Yeah. Um talking mostly in the rear areas, not so much the occupied areas. But um, I actually thought parts of Jordan's presentation rang true with me, where you see the representatives with the armies of the Alp in Italy um, saying the same things and making the same kind of requests that were coming from Kellerman uh, Army Command itself. So I would say, right, they, they weren't doing this by doing the inventories themselves. Uh, the impression I got, especially with the detailed nature of the requests, was that they were they were getting their their information directly from these uh, the logistic companies, uh, probably through the army staffs. Okay, Jordan or Paul. Uh, the vast majority of the time for the Vendee, it was scraping the bottom of the barrel. Um, sometimes going straight to the source. The, there was a foundry. Uh, downstream from Nantes uh, for artillery. Uh, so there was usually a representative there, uh, but su supply was, was a constant problem and it was usually just a complaint that we're not getting anything. So there was, it would never have been a happy relationship. And it, it evolves in, uh, in the Northern theater of war, Northern France, and then Belgium and the Rhineland, uh, going back all the way to, um, to, to late 92 before Du Maurier, you know, after near Winden becomes a, uh, becomes a traitor that the initial batch of what become the representatives on mission, they were, they were called deputies or, or commissars at that point, but they're, they're sent to do a, a, an investigation of, of his army, not initially because of any, um, you know, political motive at that point, because Du Maurier was still, uh, you know, in, in goods with the, the, the revolutionary factions that prevailed. But it was because of the desertion and the uh, administrative problems and underlying all of that was the terrible uh, supply circumstances. And, uh, you know, it, obviously that that in 1793 is uh, one of the main uh, motivations for expanding the, the representatives on mission. Of course, the political over overtones of it. Uh, is much uh, more significant in, in 1793 after after Du Maurier, um, but uh, you know this this as as you know if you've you know reading just uh, basic works on the French Revolutionary Army the supply is a huge problem throughout and obviously with the levee and mass when you're increasing the size of these armies to such a gargantuan size by 1794 it becomes an even bigger problem. Uh, the representatives you know on paper have unlimited powers. Um, but this was clearly an area where you see that just because something's written down on paper doesn't mean that it exists in reality and trying to actually um, work with other supply commissar commissars and other agents um, of, the, of the war ministry that had different committees uh, that were focused on supply and transport and those types of things. Um, that's a very uh, conflict ridden process in late 1793, early 1794. And then the committee tries to simplify it by just gutting the, uh, the, the war ministries and, and suppressing those. Um, and so for a while, the, the representatives do have these enormous requisition powers, but um, it's a process that they're really trying to control and manage as much as possible. When they move into Belgium and the Rhineland in 1794 and 1795, they do want to control it because they're they're constantly talking about the concern of nationalizing the war by overdoing it with plunder and pillage, uh, pillaging of resources in these occupied areas. So they're still they're still getting as much out of them as they can, but they want to do it through a more formal process of requisitioning uh, in which they were they were in control. Um, so it's a it's a it's a really important function of the representatives, but it, it changes so much depending upon 
which revolutionary government was in power and what the circumstances were. Yeah. Um, Paul, how about in the Vendee? That had to be a bit tricky. Well, yeah, and, and so one of the things that I found, especially early on, when when they're starting to scramble for troops, there's there's no infrastructure in place because this is a surprise. There's no intention to have a war here, um, and they're yanking soldiers from the Charente, and they're yanking people from the Vienne, you just all the surrounding departments. And from what it sounds like, they didn't look that much different than the rebels. You know, they are not properly armed. They are not properly organized. They are not trained. This is Soviet style. Well, here you go. You get in there and see what you can do. We're going to shove you in and just keep an army in the field. And, you know, there's a point, you know, the, the representative Dornier, he was left a very good journal. Uh, he's coming across soldiers that are basically starving. We haven't had bread for days. You know, they are uh, one of the great problems with discipline is how do you discipline somebody who you can't feed? Mm -hmm. And so there, you know, there are these complaints, you know, we should be giving the death penalty to these soldiers. Well, but you can't because they're starving. And so they're just trying to feed themselves by stealing from a population that won't sell anything to them. Mm -hmm. uh, people selling weapons, people selling what uniforms they do have in an attempt to obtain food. It was bad all the way through to the end. I don't think there was any point at which the army out there was well supplied um, by even a very minimal standard. Great. Um, Zev Biddle uh, asks, uh, if at all, how did the role of the representatives shift following the Thermidorian reaction? That's up to all three of you. Anyone who wants to start with that. Oh, in the, the Vendee, as my people said, it was very easy. It was make peace, figure this out, end this. You know, we need to get this back into the fold. We need to get this over with. Um, and, and there's this sudden and pretty obvious switch in political um, alignment as you're trying to choose people who are going to go there, be reasonable, make compromises, uh, do a certain amount of things under the table to to let the Republic move on to other things because they're always, you know, the Committee of Public Safety is always trying to take soldiers away from the Army of the West for, you know, more important armies like Jordan's. Uh, but uh, yeah, it's, it's get this over with, that's the goal. And they choose more moderate people to do it. Okay, thank you. Um, I, I can speak a, I, I, on that too. Um, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, the, the, the representatives on mission were always sent out by the National Convention, but with the revolutionary government that emerges in the fall of 1793, they're still sent out by the National Convention and not the Committee of Public Safety, but uh, there are several, uh, you know, uh, uh, laws or decrees passed, uh, mainly in October and December 93, in which they have to follow the orders of the Committee of Public Safety. So in the terror, um, they become less connected to the National Convention and any other um, uh, bureaucratic or, or, or uh, legislative body. And, they're, and they're, they're following the orders of the committee and they're very much the agents of the committee, which in some ways enhances their power, but it also in some ways restrains their individual power because they have to, they're, they're, they're more under pressure to execute the committee's will. And that, you know, in Alsace in 1793, when you're in close proximity to Saint-Just, that really matters. So on paper, they have unlimited powers. And on paper, uh, most of the representatives have unlimited powers. Saint-Just has extraordinary powers. Now, what the difference between that is, they never really figure out, but there's a lot of bickering over this. Well, after Thermidor, uh, the uh, process is to, uh, you know, the committee, the committee of public safety still exists and it's still powerful in some ways, but, but a lot of its responsibilities are limited and a lot of powers are taken away from it. Um, and the representatives become more just kind of less dependent on the committee and more uh, tied back to the National Convention at, as, as it was initially, uh, you know, kind of set up. And so that in some ways limits their power, but in other ways, it makes them less dependent upon the committee. Um, but over time, they do start to lose some of their uh, individual authority when it comes to immediate powers of supply and immediate powers of requisitioning, going back to what we were talking about earlier. And I think that has a, 
has a, uh, a bad impact uh, on the armies in, in the Rhineland in 1795, uh, because the, there's really no, it's in such a period of transition, there's no other supply system to emerge to fill that vacuum left by the by kind of the decline of the representative's authority. Um, so this question was originally for Mike, so I'd like him to start with that. And then, uh, but I think uh, both uh, Paul and Jordan uh, could could address it in their areas as well. Comes from Mr. McDonnell. He said, did the representatives on mission help or hinder the army? Did they improve loyalty or instill paranoia? So we'll start with Mike, because that was originally that was originally for you. Yeah, no, I think um, in the period that I was looking at, uh, it seemed like uh, these representatives were interested in making the army better. And, and the way they placed their requisitions um, were designed to do just that. Now, having said that, uh, Kellerman is constantly trying to get them to uh, pull, especially the volunteer units, the untrained folks off of the frontier into training camps so he can make them soldiers. And they don't really want to approve that. Uh, but what I was looking for kind of these uh, zealous prosecutors to go through and purge the armies, I didn't see any examples of that either in the Army of the Alps through the middle of 73 or the Army of Italy. Okay, thank you. Uh, Paul and Jordan, I think th that question could apply to your areas as well. Yeah, I'll, I'll jump in on that. I it's a hard, uh, it, it's hard to say definitively um, one way or the other. And I, I think, you know, I'm inclined to try to avoid uh, generalizing about the group uh, as much as possible and to try to understand them more as individuals um, and, and, and kind of um, more, uh, you know, kind of the particular impact that, that each one of them or each group of them had on the war effort. And of course, we won't, we, we can never know what the outcome would have been without them. You know, would would the Ministry of War agents um, have been able to fill a similar role and bring organization and bring the supplies and bring all this stuff together if you did not have representatives on mission? What would these generals have done? How would they have performed without them? That's an unanswerable, unanswerable question. I think the important thing is that the French ultimately turned the war around and uh, and and ultimately prevailed in in the 1793 and 1794 campaigns and uh, it's really a critical moment in the War of the First Coalition uh, where, you know, what had been a very kind of back and forth uh, military effort uh, in the first two years of the war pretty much shifts in France's favor, uh, both in the external war and, and also with the, with the pacification of the Vendée. And I, I, I'm inclined to say that overall, the representatives played a positive role in that, and it largely occurred because of their efforts, not despite their efforts. Yeah, I like what Jordan said. Um, in the Vendee especially, and in the West generally, because there was nothing there, because troops had been sent elsewhere uh, for the sake of the war effort, the extraordinary powers of the representatives to requisition uh, made an army in the first place. And for, I mean, it was a terrible army, but because they kept putting an army in the field, they were able to at least cordon off the rebellion. And at one point, I forget which, which representative was speaking with General Colbert, but he said, look, there, we can keep dying and stay in the field and eventually they'll run out of people, uh, which Cl Colbert suggested he not advertise that opinion. But that was, it was all too true. Even if you had a terrible army, you had an army and it, it, it was at a certain point going to grind down the manpower of this very geographically limited uh, rebellion. So in that sense, I think they absolutely mattered, uh, but they also were kind of a political lightning rod. Every general that was in command in the West uh, was conscious of the fact that they really couldn't make a politically incorrect decision, you know, to put it quite simply. And that the representatives by their presence were in a weird way able to protect the generals because by this messy process of agreeing to campaign plans, most of which were pretty bad uh, as a group, 
it protected individual generals from having to make those decisions alone. And in the context of the political turmoil, of the political mistrust of the time, it's hard to imagine that any general could have operated effectively without that kind of on the spot um, political support that the representatives provided. Thank you. Just, yeah, I'd, I'd like to actually add something to what Paul said. Um, at the soldier level, I was surprised at how involved in the Alps in Italy the representatives were about levying troops directly. They take an active hand in, in uh, enlisting National Guard battalions and companies in some of these locations. And in, in that period when Kellerman is away and there is no real command, uh, I mean, there's, a, there's an acting commander in, um, when some of these towns get taken over by the Piedmontese, the representatives, the, the way it sounds like, they literally grab these National Guard companies they themselves have been had a hand in forming and they don't lead them but they direct them into the towns and villages to reestablish control. So I, I don't think there's a lot of fear at the soldier level, um, but, but hearing Paul talk about uh, their interactions with the staffs and the generals, any sort of political commissar-like activity that I read about occurred in that senior level staff. Uh, there are a couple of staff officers that get by named uh, in the correspondence to the convention about <laughs> causing trouble. Um, but, but at the soldier level, these representatives are enlisting individual soldiers into the ranks. Well, um, it turns out that we, we have run over, uh, uh, but uh, that's a good thing. That's, that's always a good thing. So uh, I, we still had questions, but unfortunately we have to end the session now. Um, but uh, Alex uh, wants uh, me to inform everyone that uh, while we're wrapping up now, uh, we'll have a break, a uh, nice lunch break or dinner break if you're in another part of the world <laughs> or breakfast, depending on how far away you are. Uh, and uh, the next session will start at 2 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, and the next panel is new perspectives on individuals in history. I wanted to thank everybody who's joined us uh, as well as all the speakers. Uh, it's a pleasure to see you, at least virtually, since we can't see each other in person, but maybe next year as well. But we can always see Kenneth Johnson because, you know, <laughs> there he is. All right. Take care, everybody, and uh, we'll see you shortly.